Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode seven of Connections with Kenyatta Collins. I'm your host, Kenyatta Collins. Tonight on Connections, I'll introduce to you a locally owned African-American theater that gives back to the community through its commitments to education in the arts. Plus, I had a very interesting conversation with one of the city's top spiritual leaders. We spoke about church, the future, and what he enjoys in his spare time. And to all my ladies, and men too, listen up. Don't let the springtime catch you in a hairy situation. I'll have a professional esthetician here to give you a few important tips on waxing and shaving. That and much more right here on Connections with Kenyatta Collins. Are black people cursed? Can God hear my prayer? What is the meaning of life? Connections, we just love giving you the story on things that hold value to our community. This next story is sure to give you intriguing facts about the black acting scene right here in Baton Rouge. Lights, camera, action. Everybody already know your business is in the car. Didn't I tell you stay out my damn business? Huh? The African-American theater scene has grown exponentially in Baton Rouge since the early 1990s. At the forefront of that movement is Dr. Ava Brewster Turner, owner of Upstage Theater Company. The history of Upstage um, was a brainchild of mine when I uh, relocated to Baton Rouge from Memphis, Tennessee in 1985. Um, there was no black theater company here and I'd been performing in theater, um, graduated from college with a degree in theater, I taught theater in Arkansas, uh, been in theater uh, in Chicago when I was there, but there was no black theater in Baton Rouge. So I began early uh, in 1991, I believe, 92, um, with a group of young people and we were performing at different churches and that's how we actually got our start. That was the, the point for Upstage and the growth, was uh, doing um, different shows in churches and, and working with the 4th District, uh, the youth within the 4th District. Uh, that was the beginning of Upstage. Yes, this was actually our first home base. Okay. Yes, but actually Upstage started in my living room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Upstage, but we were so thankful to, to be able to move into our space here on Wooddale Boulevard. Uh, we had our grand opening in 2002. Uh, started with a, just a, a very small space, uh, some folding chairs. We didn't have a stage or anything. So we were blessed to, to get some chairs. We built a stage and we were able to get lights from there. We even had curtains back then. But actually after we expanded our stage, we took the curtains down and just continue to grow a little more and a little more and a little more after that. But when yeah. we celebrated our 15th anniversary, we relocated to the mall to our new space and we celebrated our 15th anniversary in our new location. From its beginning until the present day, the Upstage Theater Company has always showcased theater from a different perspective. Upstage Theater offers the community a part of the black experience. Uh, our motto is showcasing our heritage on stage, and that's what we do. Uh, we delve into subjects every season that we produce, five shows per season. And um, this season we are uh, talking about our, our season this year is something old and something new. And we want to offer the patrons um, the supporters, the community, uh, a, a lesson in, in history, in that history from the perspective of the black experience. So we delve into stories about education, about family, um, about the community, about politics, love, hate, all of those elements into one. We showcase something of those subjects every year. So we bring the community in to upstage and we present and showcase that story from that topic, whatever it may be, we want them to see it from the perspective of the black experience. Upstage Theater is known for showcasing the African-American experience on stage, not just locally, but throughout the U.S. as well. 
To all aspiring thespians out there, listen up. Dr. Turner has some great advice for you. If you have the desire to do that, you can do it. If you have that desire, you can do it. So you follow your instinct. I tell everybody, you train, 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 and you learn every aspect that you can learn of acting. Go to workshop, go to some classes, you know, go and visit other theater companies, watch others perform, take those experiences back, work with them, but most importantly, find someone to work with you, to bring that talent out of you. And then once you're able to take that first step, which means you take that role, regardless of how small that role is, you will blossom. For Connections, I'm Kenyatta Collins. My name is Kim Johnson and I'm the owner at the Brazilian Wax Spot located at 1713 Woodell Boulevard. We specialize in Brazilian waxing. We do full body waxing for males and females from head to toe. Now a lot of people might be thinking a Brazilian wax is painful. Well, not that much. Especially if you have someone that actually coaches you through it and they know what they're doing. A Brazilian wax shouldn't last very long. About 15 minutes, you're in and you're out. We cater to male and females. We do male and female Brazilians. In order to get a Brazilian, you need to have at least one fourth inch of hair. That's the length of a long grain of rice. You can't shave and get a wax. You need to have at least some hair so we can actually grip it with the wax. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at the Brazilian Wax Spot, or you can also go online and you can book at www.thebrazilianwaxspot.com. So check us out, the Brazilian Wax Spot, located at 1713 Wooddale Boulevard. Go follow us on social media and hope to see you soon. Bye, my lovies. <music>
uh, pleasure, privilege of watching this church expand and grow over the 50 years uh, that my father, Charles Turnbull Smith, served as pastor of this church. Uh, uh, I've watched it grow not just spiritually and numerically, but also grow organically and grow in its service uh, to this community and to its membership. And I'm just grateful that the Lord allowed me uh, to step in and be a steward here uh, since my father's passing in 2012. You stepped into a major role in 2013. Yes. You became the pastor of the leader of this flock. Yes. And I came to Shiloh in 1998. So from 98 to now, I have seen the church take a total transition in a positive way. Let's talk about some of the things that you've added to Shiloh since becoming a uh, pastor. Well, I was blessed that <clears throat> Shiloh was a full-time ministry uh, before I got here. Uh, uh, I know you asked me about me, but I have to go back and say that over the 50 years that uh, Charles Smith served as pastor of this church, this church experienced monumental growth. Uh, the church had a credit union. Uh, the church added a daycare, which has now become an early learning center. Uh, the church uh, developed a charitable foundation. Uh, the church uh, provides housing for people as well as the normal benevolence assistance that people come across. Uh, the church added a second worship experience. Uh, when I was a boy, it was Sunday school at 9.30 and worship at 11 o'clock. Now, there are two worship experiences every Sunday. Uh, the church was already on television when I got here. We added a second television experience. The church was already on radio when I got here. We've added live stream, uh, things of that sort. But I was blessed to be able to walk into a situation that was already far more advanced than the typical church in this community. Community. We have simply tried to build in a logical and incremental way upon what foundation was already laid. And uh, we think that we're in the process of becoming uh, what, what uh, God would have us be. We did little things. Uh, first year that we were here, we added screens uh, into the sanctuary. Screens upon which we watch you on every Sunday, every Sunday. As, as you provide our video announcements uh, every Sunday here in worship. We've made alterations to the worship experience. We've expanded our ministry base by adding a minister of social justice issues. And Shiloh has taken uh, a decided uh, position with regard to social justice issues in our community. We think that it's our responsibility to raise those issues, uh, both critically and uh, from the standpoint of trying to be a, uh, a helper in rectifying some of these uh, negative circumstances. So I feel like we're building on the foundation uh, that was laid, but I certainly recognize uh, that we had a great foundation to build upon. Shiloh has a huge helping hand in the community. You spoke about we provide housing, food, shelter, bill payment, yes. anything that a person needs, Shiloh has it right here. What do you say to someone, these other pastors that would probably say that, oh, Shiloh is just trying to bait members in by offering them money? No. Well, first of all, we don't have that much money at all. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the, 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 the misnomer that we are somehow a wealthy church is just that. It's a myth. Uh, it's interesting you bring that up because we were just uh, finishing up our podcast and, 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 and in the discussion that we had with uh, our guest here, I was making the point that for the most part, African-American churches are no different than African-American households. Just like you can't go very long without a paycheck, neither can uh, our churches. Uh, we need the revenues that we receive on Sunday morning in order to conduct ministry. I think that the difference that may exist from one church to the next is what you prioritize. Uh, Charles Smith believed in holistic ministry. He believed in uh, helping the total individual that, uh, yes, we're concerned about your souls, but we also have a concern about your physical needs. We have a concern about your economic needs. We have a concern about your academic needs. And if the church is to be 
uh, what Christ would have it to be. We have to address all of those concerns. So we prioritize the dollars that the members allow us to manage in such a way as we're able to do the things that we do, scholarship programs, summer enrichment programs, summer camps, things of that sort. But it only works because the membership uh, believes in the holistic ministry that we are seeking to espouse. We don't, we don't, we're not like some churches that sit on uh, mounds and mounds of money. Uh, we need every dollar that we get in order to do the ministry that we do. The difference, again, and, and forgive me for repeating myself, the difference that I see uh, has to do with priority. Uh, I've served other churches, and, and one of the things that has always been somewhat disheartening to me is that other churches did not share the same concern about the overall needs of the individual as this church uh, has shown over its 50 years plus uh, that Charles Smith was here. Okay. When you're not in the pulpit, you're not serving others, what are you doing? Listening to my wife and listening to my children. <laughs> and now that we have uh, two dogs uh, playing with my dogs, uh, I'm a homebody. Uh, I love television. Uh, if, if you ask me uh, anything, I will probably quote to you a television show <laughs> or a movie. Uh, my favorite movie series is The Godfather, parts one, two, and three. I don't know why you all <laughs> want to diss part three, but part three was almost as good as one and two. Uh, I'm, I'm, I really don't go out uh, a lot. I'm, I'm never, even before ministry, I was never a party person. Uh, uh, I, I, I like video games, uh, and, video and games? I, oh yeah, uh, really? Red Dead Redemption Part 2, I finished that in about two weeks, oh. and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a huge, and, and I love Madden, uh, I stopped playing uh, NBA 2K because my son was beating me so bad it, it, it just got to be frustrating, <laughs> so I don't, I don't even mess with it anymore, but I'm really very much a homebody, I'm a nerd. I'm, I, and, and I pride myself on being a nerd. Whenever I have the chance to talk to young women uh, in, in the church or even outside of the church, I tell them all the time, don't overlook the nerds. I, I know y'all wanna be with the cool guy, y'all wanna be with the guy with the big chest and the narrow waist <laughs> and all this other stuff, but the nerds make the best husbands. There, I said it for you. <clears throat> I'll have to remember that. <laughs> You spoke on education, and education in Shiloh is a big thing. Yes, it is. And everything, as a youth growing up here in Shiloh, and everything that we did, Pastor Charles Smith always emphasized education. Yes. So much that I am a scholarship recipient myself. In 2004, I did receive the uh, fourth place scholarship, which did help me further my education along at Southern University. But aside from that, I do want a lot of, I want everybody to know that my pastor gave me my first shot at being in front of the camera. About last year, around this time last year, and since then I've become the video announcer here, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for investing in me, for choosing me to do such a, a big job. Well, you do such a wonderful job at it, and people look forward to it Maybe. Sunday in and Sunday out. Uh, with regard to education, uh, you're right, Charles Smith placed a very high priority on education as a whole, Christian education in particular. Uh, you mentioned that you're a scholarship recipient. In order to be a scholarship recipient as a member of Shiloh, you had to have a 70% Sunday school or Bible study yes, participation sir. rate. And it's unfortunate that there are ch children, young people, uh, they don't want to be called children anymore, they're young people who pass through this church every year uh, who do not qualify for the scholarship because they won't make the investment of time uh, into the Christian education component. Uh, it's, it's one of the things that I find uh, personally disheartening and that I think that we as a church need to address uh, and emphasize a little bit more, not to reduce the requirement, but to get people to recognize the importance of meeting the requirement. Uh, it's a shame when we leave thousands of dollars on the table uh, because we did not have a sufficient number of, of members who met the qualifications. 
But yeah, Shiloh has always emphasized uh, scholarships. I'm a scholarship recipient too, 1979. <laughs> uh, and back then, the scholarships totaled $2,000. Uh, now the scholarships total somewhere in the neighborhood of $50,000. So uh, God has blessed us to be able to, to expand and grow the scholarship program. And uh, we look forward to being able to do even greater things in the future. In the future, speaking of, Shiloh is growing. Where do you see Shiloh? What direction are you steering this church for the future? Well, when I became pastor in 2013, one of the things that uh, I tried to do was to instill a vision into this congregation. We called it Shiloh 2020 okay. at that time. Uh, and it was an emphasis on uh, Christian education, emphasis on evangelism, emphasis on uh, community outreach. Uh, we have made some progress in those areas, but as we're now in the year 2019, uh, I can see where we still have a long way to go in certain areas. Shiloh is growing, uh, but the growth <coughs> that we are experiencing now is a little bit more incremental uh, than the growth that the church experienced in uh, the 90s, uh, at the time that you came. Uh, I remember vividly, I would call my father on Sunday evenings and, and ask him, well, what kind of day did you have today? And he'd say, well, we had 10 to join this morning. We had 20 to join this morning. Sometimes we had 30 to join. And, and Shiloh doesn't have that kind of phenomenal growth taking place anymore. Uh, but God is blessing us uh, with new members. God is blessing us with people who have uh, uh, wonderful ideas about where we can go with the church in the future. I do think that there needs to be greater emphasis placed on our part and specifically on my part on leading this church more uh, in evangelical ways in order to reach the community. It's not that there aren't lost people out there that need to be reached, it's that we're not doing enough to reach them. And so I take that as a personal challenge uh, that, that we have to do more in order to reach lost people for Christ. To reach those lost people and to bring them to safety in Christ, what do you think or what are some ways that you think that we could possibly do to get them here? One of the things that, that, that I have tried to do is learn more. Uh, uh, I, I call the podcast my continuing education uh, medium. Uh, we started the podcast a little bit over a year ago. Uh, you've been a guest yes, on, on our podcast. Uh, one of the things that I have tried to do with the podcast is hold interesting conversations uh, with people in this community, not necessarily people who are members of this church, and not necessarily people who are even Christian, but people in this community uh, to learn more about who they are. I'm 57 years old. There, there's no way for me to fully identify with a 37-year-old or with a 27-year-old, but I can ask questions. And if I listen uh, attentively, and, and if I uh, work hard and pray hard about it. I believe that with the information that we receive just through these conversations that I have uh, with people, uh, we can devise means and methods by which to uh, foster what I call real growth. Uh, and, and, and I, I want to make a distinction between real growth and uh, uh, less than real growth. I don't, don't want to uh, characterize it poorly. But uh, th there is the phenomenal growth that some churches are having uh, that is based on uh, poor doctrine or no doctrine, based on entertainment, uh, based on music, uh, based on other things beside a solid uh, gospel uh, message uh, that meets the needs of the total person. Uh, I call that growth swelling. Uh, and, and, and there are churches that are swollen. But just like swelling in the human body indicates that there's infection somewhere, there's infection in those churches. Uh, and, and, and churches that grow that fast often shrink just as fast as they grow because it's not built on a solid foundation. Many of those churches, as I said, are entertainment driven. Some of them are personality driven. If something happens to the personality or if something happens to the level of entertainment, uh, then people find someplace else to go. Now, I do recognize the fact that succeeding generations are less brand loyal than, say, my generation was. Uh, you're not willing to stick around uh, forever, and you're not willing to fight. Uh, you, you, you're not going to come to a church meeting and say, well, we need this, we want that, we want the other. You're just going to go find it someplace else, and we're going to look up one day, and you're not going to be here. 
So I want to do more than just have something that draws you here. I want to do something that holds you here and makes you want to come back. I want to have an open door policy. I, I want to be able to say to people that you can come in and talk to me. If, if I'm doing something that you don't like, we can talk about it. I'm not necessarily saying I'm going to agree with you, but I want the door to be open and I want us to be able to foster uh, real conversations that can result in strong churches. And talking about the services, the 8 and 11 o'clock, there's a difference between the two. Yes. Let's talk about that difference. <sighs> When I came here, Shiloh had two uh, Sunday services, uh, one at 8, one at 11. We still do that. Uh, we decided that in order to draw uh, a younger audience, we needed to streamline uh, one of the two services. Uh, at the time that I came here, they, they pretty much mirrored one another. They, they were the same service, just at two different times. And we decided that we needed to, to make some minor tweaking. You know, we're not good at monumental change, but, but we can <laughs> handle incremental change. Uh, we, we just made one or two adjustments to streamline the 11 o'clock worship and gear it more toward young people. I fully recognize, not that I'm young anymore, but I don't want to be in church all day. Uh, and, and I don't think anybody else wants to be in church all day either. Uh, this idea that uh, we're going to stay here till the spirit moves. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the spirit moved the moment you got up and came here. So for me, uh, uh, I want to be a good steward of your time. If I'm asking you to come to worship, number one, we're going to start on time. Number two, we're going to make sure that the worship is about Jesus and not about anything or anybody else. And number three, I'm going to get you out of here on time because you want to go watch the Saints game. Or now that the Saints season is over, you want to go watch whatever it is you want to watch or do with your day, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, so I think that people value the fact that I appreciate their time. Uh, I also think that it helps to draw young people when they see young people. So uh, at the 11 o'clock worship, we put our young adult praise team on display and uh, they're outstanding singers and, and, and they do a wonderful job. And I have watched the change in how people respond to the praise period now that they know that these are the young people that are going to be leading them in worship. So it, it, it's things like that where, where we have made a conscious effort to make 8 o'clock a more traditional worship experience. Not overly long, but more traditional, and make the 11 o'clock worship a more streamlined and contemporary worship experience. And for the most part, I think people have responded well to that. Thank you for joining me on today. I look forward to many, many more interviews, and I look forward to being on TV on Sunday as well. I'm going to see you Sunday morning you on the You will see you Sunday morning right yes, early. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching this interview. We'll be right back. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's episode of Connections with Kenyatta Collins. Be sure to continue to like and share all of my Connections videos and follow me on YouTube. It's been real, but it's time for me to retire for the night. But don't worry, we'll meet again next Friday, same place, same time. Have a great night and happy Black History Month to you all. Good night.